Da, da, da. All right, here we go, guys. So it is officially seven o'clock. I would like to welcome you. Thank you all so much for being here. Greetings. My name is Willa Soroka, and I am the education specialist here with New Hampshire Audubon. I'm so thrilled that you could join us this evening for our final presentation of our pollinator webinar series brought to you by New Hampshire Audubon. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is streaming to you from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the site of the ancient village of Penacook in Endakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnambak, who have stewarded Endakina for throughout the generations for thousands of years. New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue the stewardship of these lands, providing opportunities for all people to form connections to the natural world through our programs and wildlife sanctuaries around the state. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca exhibited here. Here on the site, you can explore and click on territories of indigenous peoples and get connected to resources to learn more. For a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, consider checking out the educational resources at indigenousnh.com. Some Zoom information before we dive in. We do have approximately 170 people registered for this evening's talk. So you'll see that we are in full webinar mode. That means that all of your cameras have been set to off and your audio is set to mute. So feel free to munch and crunch and sip and enjoy yourself this evening. We can't see or hear you. Please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, and reactions you might have and reserve the Q&A button for any questions that you would like answered by one of tonight's presenters. For those of you who joined us for the last pollinator webinar, way back in, what was it, June? I think we were talking about native bees. Welcome back. Your enthusiasm for our organization, and more specifically, tonight's topic, is so greatly appreciated. For those of you attending for the first time this evening, we are very grateful for your presence. Many thanks go out to the Benjamin Couch and Gertrude Couch Trust for their generous grant, which enables us to bring these amazing speakers to our webinars, where we can share in their enthusiasm and learn from their experience without having to leave the comfort of our homes. Before we jump into tonight's presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. For those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from national Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars. Conserving around 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for both habitat as well as recreation. Researching trends and discovering solutions for species in peril. Connecting people to nature through environmental education via school programs, field trips, summer camps, and webinars like these. And lastly, advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature to protect the natural environment for wildlife and for people. If anyone in attendance tonight is a volunteer, a member, or a supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply could not achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you'd like to become a part of our conservation family, please check out our website for ways to get involved. I'd like to pass the mic now on to our senior biologist, Diane DeLuca, who has been an integral part of the development of not only this pollinator webinar series, but an incredible pollinator demonstration gardens located at our headquarters in Concord. If you haven't checked it out, I highly encourage it. It's very much worth the trip. Diane, whenever you are ready. Thanks, Willa. I'd just like to give Willa a huge shout out for being the face of Audubon and co-hosting all of these pollinator webinars. It's been just a pleasure for me to be able to uh, work with her for this. So tonight we are thrilled and honored to have Doug Ptolemy with us to present tonight's pollinator webinar. And I really can't think of a more perfect speaker to close out our pollinator series for 
2022. So Doug is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored well over 100 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 41 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His first book, Bringing Nature Home, brought to light the critical link between native plant species and native wildlife and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in February of 2020 and outlines his vision for a grassroots approach to conservation that begins in our own backyards. His latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released in March of 2021. And in that same year, Doug also co-founded Homegrown National Park. And I'm sure we'll share more details of this initiative tonight. Um, his awards and recognitions are many and include the Garden Writers Association, um, National Audubon, the National Wildlife Federation, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticulture Association. Tonight's Doug's presentation titled, The Little Things That Run the World, will highlight the many essential roles insects play and describe the simple changes we must make in our own landscapes to keep insects on the ground, in the air, and on our plants. And Doug, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. We're um, so excited to have you here. Well, thanks, Diane. It is a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> And I am going to talk about uh, making insects, a guide to restoring the little things that run the world. Of course, that's not my expression. That comes from E.O. Wilson, uh, who died the day after Christmas this year uh, at the age of 92. And he worked right up to the end. Very long career at uh, Harvard. And, and uh, one thing that was consistent throughout his, his very long career was, and he certainly was an entomologist, a myrmecologist loved and studied ants, but he was concerned about uh, biodiversity and its, its conservation throughout his entire career. Way back in 1987, he wrote this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, uh, and his, his uh, object, I believe, was to point out how important insects were and we better, better take care of them. He had one simple message, and that was that life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And in most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the, the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals would all collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers <clears throat> and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. Of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. So that was a somber message but this was 1987. Nobody really was worried about losing insects. Uh, so it was, it was ignored. And besides, if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now, this was 1929. <clears throat> it was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects. Not just pest insects, all insects. We're going to get rid of all of them. That's kind of part of our culture. It's still part of our culture, unfortunately even though we don't have National Insect Killing Week anymore. <clears throat> now, even if we succeed in killing all the insects in agriculture, because we certainly try to do that, and all the insects at home, we don't worry about losing insects because we think they are still common in our natural areas. There's a couple of reasons why that's not true anymore. And one of them is that we don't have enough natural areas anymore. We've taken those natural areas and turned them into our cities, and they're not designed to support insects. We're into our suburbs, and they're not designed to support anything. Or even our rural areas uh, are not designed to support insects. Of course, we have agriculture, <clears throat> 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. It's uh, supposed to be designed to support cattle, but it's typically overgrazed and, and degraded land, so not many insects there. As a matter of fact, agriculture now... Um, occupies nearly half of terrestrial earth, and those areas are not designed to support insects either. The other reason that, that insects are not doing well uh, in our natural areas anymore is that those natural areas are 
not only too small and too isolated, but they are in, invaded by non-native plants. Almost all of them are invaded by non-native plants, plants from other continents that are very poor at supporting insects. This is what a natural area near me looks like. I took this picture in the spring when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So every bit of green you see there is a non-native plant that is poor at supporting insects. Uh, and we'll talk about why they're so poor at supporting insects, but when we have invasive plants displace native plants, uh, it really clobbers those, those insects. Now, when I was young, <clears throat> and probably when many of you were young, sites like this were common. You looked up at a street light and that's what it looked like. There were insects everywhere. You drove in your car and it got pretty splattered. Uh, that just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and those are that's anecdotal evidence that insects have declined, but a lot of people are talking about it. So it really seems like we're winning our war against insects, even if it's an undeclared war. And that's why we're seeing head headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Uh, so several years ago, we noticed that honeybees were in trouble. So we started measuring uh, lots of, of insects, started with the bees, uh, our native bees. 50% of our, our native bee species have disappeared from their historic ranges in the last century. There are four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% in the last 20 years. So they're not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. They're no longer common enough to be performing their roles as pollinators in our, our natural areas. There are three species of bumblebees that may already be extinct, and 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Now, they've done a better job of measuring insect decline in Europe. 30% <clears throat> of Europe's uh, orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets, are now facing extinction. There was a big study in Germany uh, that said that G Germany has lost 79% of its flying insects since 1989. That's, that's a study that really got uh, the people alarmed. There are 46 species of moths and butterflies that have already disappeared from Germany. And globally, invertebrate abundance, largely insects, has declined 45% since 1974. And of course, as insects decline, so do the birds that require them, that need them, particularly during breeding. That's what they're, they're breeding on. We've got 432 species of North American birds that are now threatened with extinction, not because there's only four or five left of each, but because of the trajectory of their population declines. Uh, all those species are, are declining rapidly. We now have 3 billion fewer breeding birds today than we had just 50 years ago. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the group that says we've lost 3 billion breeding birds and divided the terrestrial birds into two groups. The species that require insects, particularly when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. Uh, so things like uh, doves and, and finches can actually make a little milk out of seeds and they don't need insects. And look, they haven't lost any, any numbers at all in the last 50 years, but the species that require insects have lost on average 10 million individuals per species. Doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest that as you take insects away, you as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. <coughs> Great Britain has sterilized its landscape so much that even the invasive birds, the uh, English sparrow and starling are now red listed in Great Britain. So uh, we're having serious biodiversity uh, losses. Uh, we're losing the insects, we're losing the birds that depend on them and so many other things that we're not even mentioning. Uh, and, and now the UN says that uh, up to a million species face extinction in the next 20 years. Actually, they said that two years ago, so maybe it's the next 18 years. <clears throat> it's a very, very alarming statistic, and it makes a nice headline. But I'll tell you one thing. It is not an option, folks. We have to make sure these species do not go extinct because these are the species that not only keep our birds and everything else alive on planet Earth, they keep us alive on planet Earth. So that's the question. A lot of people wonder, who cares? Does it matter if we lose species? Well, the insects are the little things that run the world. And if they're disappearing, then it does matter. These are the creatures that keep us alive and they are disappearing. It's really hard to get humans to um, react to news that they consider to be long-term problems. I mean, you see that with climate change, you know, uh, it's a problem, but you know, it's gonna happen to another generation. So we don't do too much about it. 
but it's pretty easy to get humans to feel empathy for other animals. So I'm gonna approach this problem of, of uh, insect loss from the perspective of another animal, particularly birds. Let's view it from the perspective of a bird and particularly a magnolia warbler. I want you to pretend you're this magnolia warbler and you have just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of Costa Rica. It is time for you to fly north to reproduce which means you're going to undertake the most dangerous thing you will ever do in your life, and that is migration. Predation risks are high during migration, uh, and energy consumption is, is enormous. Uh, just when you fly across the Gulf of Mexico, you lose 35% of your, your body weight. As a matter of fact, during uh, all of your, your flights, you can fly up to 300 miles in a single night. You typically lose 35 to 50% of your body weight. So when you hit the, hit the land, and when you, you come down to a uh, stopover point, you have to put that body weight back on. You've got to restore your fat bodies, and you do that by eating insects at each rest stop. <clears throat> so migration is, is difficult on birds, and you might wonder why it evolved. And the answer is it evolved for the same reason that other things evolved. The benefits of migration outweighed the costs. So what are the benefits of migration? Well, in the temperate zone, every spring you have the expansion of leaves and following the expansion of that, those leaves are the, come the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And that is the food that fuels at least spring migration uh, up into the temperate zone. So when, when birds migrate, they have more food. That's what it boils down to. You have this giant flush of, of protein produced in the temperate zone, and that doesn't occur in the tropics. In the tropics, there's intense competition. It's much more steady. You don't have this, this um, flush of, of resources uh, at one particular time of the year. So it really was the spring bonanza of insects that gave uh, birds an opportunity to produce more offspring if they flew north. If they stay in the tropics, they could make two to four uh, babies per year on average, but if they flew to the temperate zone, they could rear three to six offspring per year. Doesn't seem like much, but it's enough to offset all of the downsides of, of uh, migration. So that's it, increased reproduction balances the cost of migration. Bird migration was only adaptive because there were so many insects in the temperate zone to allow that extra reproduction. How important are insects to birds? Uh, a group in the 2018, I don't know how they came up with this measurement, but they said that birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year globally. Uh, that's a lot of insects. And they, they uh, stated this in the same language that, that, that we traditionally do. They say birds eat 500 million tons of pests each year, as if all insects are, are pests. So let's restate that and just say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year just to be birds. And if you take away some of those insects, you're going to have fewer birds. So when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone. Are there still enough insects in the temperate zone to justify migration? Well, every time we measure it, it doesn't matter where we go, the answer seems to be no. Let's look at just what happens on the ornamental plants that we have loaded the landscapes with. You know, we've got 135 million acres of residential landscapes. Our birds have to migrate right through those landscapes, and this is what so many of them look like. Well, I'm going to share, we've been measuring this for a number of years. I'll share one, the results of one study with you that I did with an undergrad a few years ago. We simply walked into hedgerows that were invaded with uh, non-native plants. This has got a lot of autumn olive in it and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and lots of other things, and measured caterpillar communities in these hedgerows and compared them to caterpillar communities and hedgerows that were not invaded. So this was uh, Delaware, North, Northeast Maryland, and Southeast Pennsylvania. And this is what we found <clears throat> in the invaded hedgerows. There were 68% fewer um, species overall of caterpillars, 91% uh, reduction in abundance of caterpillars and a 96% reduction in the biomass of those caterpillars, the energy that was in those hedgerows. And that is the energy that birds depend on, particularly when they're breeding. So in other words, we've taken away 96% of the bird food when we allow these non-native plants to uh, invade our hedgerows. Uh, 
this doesn't affect just a few obscure species of birds. It affects our migrants. It affects 386 species of neotropical migrants that may no longer have enough insects to justify their, migrant, their migration because of the way we've treated our North American landscapes. We're talking about our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings, our flycatchers, our thrushes, our warblers, night jars. There's so many groups of birds that depend on insects. <clears throat> now, a lot of people say, well, I don't have uh, a property big enough for a bird to breed on, and that, uh, that could be true. They need a fair amount of, of property. But if you have area for that's big enough for a single tree, you can help birds during migration, but it has to be the right tree. Ginkgos, by, for example, from, you know, ginkgo biloba from Asia, produces zero caterpillars, so they're not going to add any energy to uh, the diet of a, a migrant. And don't forget about all the resident birds that need insects to rear their young as well. So things like chickadees and titmice and, and uh, all of those birds that do not migrate, when it comes time to reproduce, they are rearing their young on insects, largely caterpillars, and it takes thousands of them. Carolina chickadee, for example, requires 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get the the young to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of a uh, bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird, get one clutch of a bird to, uh, to uh, independence. So it's not just a few caterpillars, and this is one, one bird, one nest. If we want a diversity of birds in our neighborhood, we need a lot of caterpillars. What if I said to you, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%. I would not have to, to argue with you uh, to convince you that that was important. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. <clears throat> I do have to argue with people to convince them that that's important. We cannot afford to lose the insects that run the ecosystems that we depend on. It is our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. So I think our only viable option is to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us, to live sustainably with the natural world that sustains us. And that's a world that has to include insects. So how are we gonna do this? Well, I always go back to private property. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And that's because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. We can't ignore it. And that's properties like this. So how do we save insect populations on a property like this? It certainly wasn't designed to do that. First, we have to understand what the, the causes of insect declines are. <clears throat> Dave Wagner at the University of Connecticut says that insect decline, it's, it's like death from a thousand cuts. There's so many different causes of them. The misuse and overuse of pesticides, certainly a big problem. Habitat loss. Remember what a habitat is. It's not just a place to live. It's something to eat. And we've taken away so many of the plants that these insects need to eat. Plant choice, that's how we've done that. We've choose these uh, non-native plants, ornamental plants to load our landscapes. And then many of them escape and become invasive species in our natural areas. Uh, and that's invasive species, a huge problem. Light pollution is another important source of insect declines. And then of course, climate change. But I actually see this as good news because all of these causes, misuse and overuse of pesticide, habitat loss, plant choice, security lights, invasive species, all of them can be addressed by individuals on our own private properties. Climate change is tougher for an individual to address. But um, a single person can modify uh, what's happening on their own property and actually turn around the fate of uh, all kinds of insect populations right where they live. All right, so now we know we can do it. Which insects should we decide to save? Which ones should we make at home? Well, there are a lot of insects out there. Three to four million species is the estimate worldwide. It's an estimate because there's still at least more than two million species that we haven't even described yet. Uh, and some of them are right here in, in the U.S. It's not just in, in Peru. We've got 164,000 species in, in the U.S. that have been described. Uh, so we're not going to have all those on our property. Which one should we focus on? I think we should focus on the two most important insect groups. And I'm going to argue that the insects that maintain plant diversity would be one of those groups. And the insects that then take energy from the plants to other animals 
that enable a diverse food web to be the other most important groups, which means we're talking about our pollinators. They're the ones that, that maintain the diversity of plants by allowing them to reproduce. And we're talking about caterpillars. They're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Let's first talk about pollinators briefly. Um, you've had already had lots of talks about pollinators, um, but the world is interested in pollinators and that's great. So I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time focusing on that. You know what that plant is, by the way? That's, that's Virginia creeper. <clears throat> Very inconspicuous flowers, but boy, does it attract the, uh, the native bees. Let's review why we need pollinators. You hear all the time we need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. Uh, May Baerbaum at the University of, of Illinois says, no, it's actually about a twelfth of our crops. She doesn't know where that third figure came from. Um, and I hear people say, well, you know, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. That's why I don't like the crop argument. Let's forget the crop argument. We all need pollinators and we need pollinators everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere because they're pollinating most of the plants. 80% of all our plants and 90% of all of our flowering plants are pollinated by animals. So losing pollinators is not an option unless we wanna lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. I'm not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship here. You know, it's interesting. We're in the coming up on a big election. And we hear all the debates on the radio and on the television. I don't hear anybody talking about insect decline as if it just doesn't matter. It's not important at all. Okay, we do know how to conserve bee populations. Again, you've heard a lot about that. Uh, we need to plant for specialist bees. We've got 4,000 species of, of uh, native bees out there and over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. If you plant for specialists, uh, you have also planted for generalists because they can use those plants. If you only plant for generalists, you've lost your specialists and we don't wanna do that. Uh, so you wanna plant for specialists and you also wanna plant a diversity of plants that are gonna pr provide pollen throughout the season. Pollen and nectar from April all the way through October. Um, that can be a challenge, but that's the goal. And that's all I'm gonna say about pollinators right now. <clears throat> I'm gonna move on to caterpillars because nobody talks about them. They are the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. Uh, and losing caterpillars is, is devastating to uh, local food webs. <clears throat> and again, that's because of, of this statistic that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of insect. If we design landscapes that do not have enough caterpillars and then we've got failed food webs, and then eventually failed ecosystems. So how do we increase the number of caterpillars in our yards? Well, you add the plants that support caterpillars. Um, that seems pretty straightforward. Um, there is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. And this is a perfect example. This is elderberry in my yard. A uh, wonderful flowering plant, supports a lot of pollinators, makes great berries for the birds but uh, almost no insects can eat the leaves. So it's, it's not making the caterpillars that allow those birds to reproduce, which means we've got to focus on the plants that do produce a lot of caterpillars or it's not going to work. Um, and what we have to do is understand that most of the insects that are out there, most of the caterpillars that are out there are host plant specialists. Uh, so consider the monarch butterfly can only eat it's a specialist on milkweeds. And it's a specialist on milkweeds because plants have made it specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They capture the energy from the sun and they load their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, <clears throat> which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? The monarch does eat the milkweeds. How does it, how does it do that? Well, it does that through the specialization I mentioned. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only develop and reproduce on the plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses, to circumvent them. 
but it takes a long period of evolutionary history for all those adaptations to fall into place. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to the compounds. Um, so they're locked in. At the end, they are locked into the uh, plant that they have specialized on. Uh, so for example, if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not going to start to be able to develop on hostas. It's locked into eating milkweed, so it has two choices. Uh, it can fly away and find milkweed someplace else, or it can starve to death. It boils down to the fact that there are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. There are plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and there are plants that actually detract energy from local food webs. A great example of a contributor would be one of the oaks. They're contributing more energy, supporting more uh, biodiversity than any other type of, of uh, any other plant genus in North America. Good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo. Uh, it's a nice tree, has good fall color. It's not invasive, but it just sits there. Nothing can eat a ginkgo, so it's not contributing any energy to local food webs. And a good example of a detractor would be something like calorie pear or burning bush or barberry, our ornamentals that don't support insects, but do escape into our natural areas and displace the native plants in those natural areas. Um, so you're getting rid of the plants that do provide energy to food webs and replacing it with a plant that doesn't. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. <clears throat> if you're going to restore food webs, if you're going to, to support the insects around you, you have to use the right plants or it's not going to work. So for example, if I want the Pandora Sphinx uh, to be making a living at my house, I've got to have Virginia creeper. That's what the uh, caterpillars develop on. If I want the tulip tree silk moth, I need tulip trees. If I want lunamos at my house, it's got to be sweet gum. That's what they specialize on. Um, that can vary as you move around the country but it's sweet gum at my house. Zebra swallowtail, a super specialist on pawpaw. Um, Eight-spotted forester moth on grape. Grape supports a number of specialists. The green marvel on viburnum, brown hooded owlet on goldenrod, the beautiful utilia on poison ivy. Yeah, even poison ivy supports insects. I hear people groaning. You know, when you get poison ivy, you get poison ivy when you try to get rid of it. Just ignore it. You can run faster than it can. Don't touch it and you won't get it. The <clears throat> sculptured moth on persimmon, every tree or, or plant that's out there supports at least one specialist uh, insect, particularly moths. The Hebrew on black gum, the, our, our ashes uh, support a number of sphinx moths, like the fawn sphinx, our poor beleaguered ashes. Rosy maple moth on, on maples, the royal walnut moth on walnut and hickory, this, this moth has already been extirpated from New England. If you find one, tell somebody because uh, they're, they're essentially gone. A good example of losing our important insects. double tooth prominent on elm, witch hazel dagger moth on witch hazel, the imperial moth on pine. Even clematis has a specialist, spotted thyrus on clem clematis, two-toned ancillus on ironwood, the lost owlet on buttonbush, the herald on native willows, the snowberry clearwing on native honeysuckle, the coral honeysuckle, evening primrose, moth is, believe it or not, on evening primrose. <clears throat> and the moth comes and spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it uh, gets crowded in there. It's all very cute. Showy emerald on sumac. And then you've got a couple of, of genera that are really powerhouse genera, like native prunus, things like black, black uh, cherry and pin cherry. Um, we'll give you the uh, white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the cecropium moth, the colorful zaley the tufted bird dropping moth. And I ask you, who would not want the tufted bird dropping moth in there? there? It'd be fun just to say the name. The paddle caterpillar. Ask your kids to go out and find the paddle caterpillar and figure out what those paddles are for. They're not there for decorations. They have a function. Don't tell them what it's for. And I'm not gonna tell you what it's for either. I want you to think about it and come up with the right answer. It's the same answer that the uh, same reason the filament geometer has these expandable filaments on its back. These guys are all on black cherry, the small eyed Sphinx. Harris's three spot holds a little umbrella of its, its shed head capsules over its head. And if you touch it, it'll whack you with them. The snowy shouldered A. Claris is also on, on uh, black cherry. Then we have the, the most uh, important plant of all, and that's one of our oaks. We'll support the hag moth, thinks it's a tarantula. 
the red wash caterpillar, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak moth, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, orange patch smoky wing, the half oval ancillus, the crown slug, the pink striped oak worm. This is my favorite, the spun glass slug, and literally hundreds more species are on oaks. <clears throat> and that's why I call oaks keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. Those are the keystone plants. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold that house up. They're the support. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. Uh, so oaks, number one keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars compared to tulip trees support 21. Huge differences among our native plants. 950 species supported nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. If you wanna know what the keystone species are, where you live, go to Native Plant Finder at the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of both the woody and herbaceous plants in your county that are best at supporting uh, caterpillars and also the specialist bees. Let's look at these three genera here. Solidagos, goldenrods, the native asters, perennial sunflowers. Not only do they support the most caterpillars, but 110 caterpillars on, on goldenrods, by the way. They also support the most specialist bees. If you have goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers, there's at least 44 species of bees that can be in your yard that will not be there if you don't have those three genera. <clears throat> so you might wonder where I took all these pictures. That's where I took all these pictures, right in our yard. This is what our yard looked like when we moved in in the year 2000. It was a farm that had broken up into 10-acre uh, lots, had been mowed for hay before we moved in. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. We put uh, a lot of the plants back, not all of them, still working on it. Uh, and our research has shown that if you count the number of moss species in your local food web, you can, that's a good index of the, um, not just the diversity of, of the food web, but the stability of that food web and the productivity of that food web. It's all uh, revealed by the number of species of moths, not butterflies. Butterflies are just bad tasting day flying moths. They're bad tasting, which means they're not contributing a lot to local food webs. So I've been doing that for the last five years. I've been counting the species of moths that make a living in our house since we put the plants back. And I'm up to 1,196 species of, of moths so far, so far. Just added another one just the other day. And we had those species because we put the plants back. We planted witch hazel and oaks and persimmon and American elm and maples and ashes, all of these things. We tolerated what a lot of people consider to be weeds. We tolerated black cherry. People are usually pulling them out. Ferns, grapes, very powerful plant. Uh, tulip trees, Virginia creeper. People don't like Virginia creeper, but I don't know why. It's a great native plant. Goldenrod, sumac. Black willow, yes, we tolerated our poison ivy, our green briar, even dotter. Every one of these plants supports specialist moths. And because we have all of those, those uh, caterpillars, remember the moths are making caterpillars in our yard. We also have the birds that eat those caterpillars. We've got wood thrush <clears throat> because we've got Virginia creeper making the lettered sphinx. We've got indigo bunnies because we have allers making ruby quakers. We've got chipping sparrows because we have black walnuts making gray edged boma locas. We've got field sparrows because we have oaks making red line panapotas. Tufted tip mice because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions. We've got phoebes because we have native grasses making skippers. We've got robins because of all of those native weeds making a bunch of moths and they eat them all. We've got Carolina chickadees because we have tulip trees making tulip tree beauty. White eyed vireos because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtails. We have house wrens because we have hickories making copper underwings. <clears throat> and of course we have bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. We have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why is that important? Well, you know, we see this, this headline all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic, but 
I'm thinking not at our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. Imagine what would happen if everybody put the plants back. We could turn statistics like this around. So by choosing the right plants and using more of them, we could restore insects nearly everywhere. <clears throat> and I'm gonna leave you with nine things that you can do to restore the ecosystem in your yard by protecting insect populations. We'll look at each one of them. First one would be cut your lawn in half. We've got 44 million acres of lawn in the US. Uh, that's a size greater than all of New England combined and it's dedicated to an ecological deadscape. <clears throat> so we need lawn because it's a status symbol but we also need lawn to display our Halloween decorations and I understand that. But we cut that area of lawn in half. I drive by this, this uh, church in Mississippi when I go down there and I always it just struck me that people are inside the church uh, worshiping God's creations and they're killing them all on the outside of the church. They're just not thinking. They're just not thinking. <clears throat> okay, plant for specialist bees. Now we talked about that. Um, it's Sam Drogi who really suggests that we do this. He's Mr. Mr. Native Bee. We wanna meet the needs of our specialists because the generalists will use those plants as well. How do you find out what your, your specialist bees are and the plants that support them? You go to Keystone Plants by Eco Region. It's another uh, part of the National Wildlife Federation website. There's the URL. Uh, and it will rank by Eco Region the um, plants that are best at supporting specialist bees and the number of bees that it supports. Remove invasive species from your property. Almost everybody has some invasive species on their property, either because they've invaded your property or because you have planted them. It's often on the corners, you're not thinking about it, but you wanna remove those. Uh, and, and because they're, they're providing the seed stock that then spreads out everywhere. Think of invasive species as if they were ecological tumors. They just keep growing and then they escape into our natural areas and, and, and castrate them, ecologically castrate them. These are you know, just some of the ones that are important. English ivy, of course, calorie pear, porcelain berry, terrible down where I am. I hope it's not, I'm sure it's coming up to you guys, but burning bush, of course, privet, Chinese elm, buckthorn, you know, buckthorn, emmer, honeysuckle. We, we can make a bigger list than this, but um, make sure you don't harbor these on your property. Use keystone plants. We talked about that. We want to pick the plants that are that are the biggest contributors when we're replanting that half of the area lawn we're going to take out. Uh, and we want to landscape for caterpillars. What does that mean? Well, this is just an example, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. Well, they wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish growing as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree and wiggle their way beneath the soil surface uh, and, and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact the area under our trees so that the soil is rock hard. Very difficult for those caterpillars to get underground. So this becomes an ecological trap. If the adult moths fly in and lay their eggs here and the caterpillars develop, they drop down and they die. So I'm convinced that the way we landscape under our trees is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. <clears throat> this is what most people do. They've got a, a tree in a yard. Uh, you know, surrounded by lawn. And I've got a new grad student this, this year who is starting to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they do much better in a layered landscape like this. That creates a soft landing for those caterpillars. They drop from the tree, maybe, uh, you know, a, a dogwood, a native azalea, ferns, ground cover. It's not being mowed. It's not being compacted. Nobody's going to step on them or squish them. The soil is easy to get underneath and pupate in, and there's plenty of leaf litter for them to pupate in. Survivorship is going to be much higher in a situation like this. This is where you can do your spring, your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, folks. You put big beds around all of your trees, and all of a sudden you've got a lot less lawn out there. Your tree will love it. Your watershed will love it, and all those caterpillars will have safe sites to pupate in. 
good place to use your uh, native ground covers, things like wild ginger, mayapple, foam flower, ferns. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants uh, because when you landscape like this, densely like this, it's perfect for those uh, overwintering caterpillars. Okay, you want to reduce your light pollution. A lot of insects uh, or uh, studies are suggesting that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines, um, at least in the temperate zone around the world. If we landscape in a way that invites all those insects to our yard and then have security lights on at night, we're going to kill them. So that doesn't make any sense. This is all the ways that those lights uh, actually do kill insects, particularly those, those uh, nocturnal moths that produce the caterpillars that run our, our food webs. Now, to me, this is actually good news. It's good news because we have to turn around insect declines. And if we can do that by just flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. But I know what you're gonna say. Well, I can't turn the lights out uh, over my barn or over my garage or over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your, your outdoor light so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna notice is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, put in a yellow bulb, um, yellow yellow uh, incandescent bulb, but they also have yellow LEDs. Be careful about the LEDs. Sometimes they take uh, a blue wavelength and just paint the bulb uh, yellow. So that's not going to do it. We need yellow soft wavelengths because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects, insects than our white wavelengths. So if we replace our white bulbs with yellow bulbs overnight, we could save millions of insects. And if we use the appropriate LEDs, we could save millions of dollars as well. Opposed mosquito spraying. <clears throat> you know, uh, mosquito fogging, Mosquito Joe is a, it's a booming business around the country. Uh, it became a booming, booming business after a few people brought Zika virus to Florida. The, the virus never actually got in our mosquito population, but we're killing all the mosquitoes anyway. Uh, but mosquito just says it's okay because uh, it's a natural product. And it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids, which uh, that's the compound found in chrysanthemums. Uh, it's there, evolved there to kill insects. But this is industrial strength, in, industrial strength pyrethroids. I don't like that argument because cyanide is a natural product too. So being natural doesn't mean it's not deadly. Mosquito Joe also says that this only kills mosquitoes. And I wish he was right. I really do. But he's not right. It kills all the insects. And I mean all the insects. Look at where it goes. That's all the pollinators. That's the monarchs. Big monarch kills a couple of years ago when they flew through uh, mosquito fogging. Hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. Um, and the interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of them, so it's not, uh, not effective. If you really want to control mosquitoes, do it uh, through biocontrol using mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay or dead leaves or, or maybe dead grass, <clears throat> put it out in the sun and let it build up populations of diatoms and algae. That is what mosquito larvae eat. Then that becomes an irresistible brew to ovipositing mosquitoes. They will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mosquito dunks. Put a single mosquito dunk in your bucket. That's Bacillus thuringiensis, a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it's very targeted. It's cheap. That costs what, $9, $12. If a dragonfly gets in, it doesn't hurt it. If your dog drinks it, it doesn't hurt it. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so that uh, a chipmunk doesn't commit suicide, but this is a cheap targeted way to control mosquitoes without killing anything else. <clears throat> and if you don't even want to do that and you're just going to have a party in your backyard during mosquito season, get a fan, turn it on. It creates enough breeze, enough wind that mosquitoes cannot fly into it. It's a cheap, easy way to enjoy your yard without killing anything. Minimize insecticide use overall. It's not just mosquito spraying that's causing a problem. Go to the hardware store and look at the number of, of insecticide products on the shelf. It's you know row after row after row of things that are designed to kill insects. Now we do have to control termites in, in our homes, but that is the only thing that uh, really needs control. Most of this, this insecticide use by homeowners is unnecessary. Uh, and it means you are living in an envelope of, of insecticide, of poison. 
Uh, and who knows what the long-term effects of that are. <clears throat> this includes bug zappers, no bug zappers. You know, we did a study way back in 1996. People love their bug zapper. They put it on and then go zap and it kills, kills bugs. And they think it's killing all your mosquitoes. But our study showed that 99.98% of the insects killed by bug zappers are not mosquitoes, are not biting flies at all. They're non-targets. So your bug zapper is killing a lot of insects, but none of the ones that you really want to kill. It's just another devastating impact on local insect populations. This is something I've never tried, but it's, it's out there. You could try it. It's a mosquito racket. It's actually got batteries in here that electrifies this. You swing it at the mosquito and it'll kill it, but only the mosquito. Give it a try. Then finally, join your HOA and change from within. Um, I hear all the time that people say, we, I can't do what you're saying. I can't reduce my lawn. I can't put in more plants and, and blah, 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 because my HOA says uh, I'm not allowed to do that. Well, HOAs are, are people. Uh, and the rules they make up are made by people. And they're made by people who don't understand the ecological impact of, of uh, many of those silly rules. So join your HOA and educate them. Tell them you know, that, that uh, okay, we won't have rusty cars in our front yard, but it doesn't mean we have to have all non-native plants that look identical. And I'm getting emails from people that, that are saying, you know, this works. They have joined their HOA, people are listening and the rules are starting to light, lighten up. All right, I'm going to end the way I started, and that is with uh, E.O. Wilson. <clears throat> Not only did he, he tell us that insects are the little things that run the world, he also told us if we don't save functioning ecosystems, if we don't save nature on half of planet Earth, we're going to lose life on all of planet Earth. And he did that in Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, published it in 2016. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. We've got to save nature on half of planet Earth. That's a big, bold statement. And it's something that, that conservation biologists are very happy about. That's great. We'll just put half of the planet aside. Problem is, remember what half the planet already is. It's in some form of agriculture. We've got 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our, our airports and roads and detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for, for nature. So how can we actually do this? Um, well, this is what I talk about all the time. I do think that we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation. Our old approach uh, embraced the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist. We can't live together in the same place at the same time. We've got to give that up. That's just not true. Uh, and it has caused all the problems that we're seeing today. We keep expelling nature to someplace else, and there is no someplace else anymore. So now we need to find ways to coexist in the same place at the same time. That doesn't mean that you have to uh, save insects for a living, but you can save them where you live. And when you do, it really empowers you. <clears throat> you know, people look around at the world today and, and they get upset. They know that the earth has some serious problems. They're upset about global insect decline, but they feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? One person can do all the things we just talked about. They can shrink the lawn, which doesn't uh, accomplish any of the ecological goals of our landscapes. They can fire Mosquito Joe. They can change their light bulbs. They can, they can get rid of their invasive plants. They can put in keystone plants. They can plant a pollinator garden. One person can do all of that and totally revitalize the insect populations on their property and then enhance their local ecosystems instead of degrading them. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't take on the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can impact. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park, help a preserve, land conservancy. As a volunteer, they will love you. They're all underfunded and all understaffed. So insect decline is a global problem, but it has a grassroots solution. There are a lot of us out there. And if we all did our part, if we all exercised our responsibility towards good earth stewardship, we can solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doug. I'm sorry. I'm back. I'm here. I think all of us are sitting here just absorbing and digesting 
what was a really impressive presentation with a very hopeful outcome at the end. I have been sitting here writing all of my questions down and then saying, oh, no, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 and we have answers, awesome. So um, let's take some questions from the audience for sure. Um, while everyone's kind of decompressing that and, and absorbing it in their own ways, I'm gonna open up the Q&A and, um, and see what we, can, what, we can, what we can answer. So- right, um, I I just saw a question there about Homegrown National Park, and and oh. uh, should let me screen share one more time here. Oh, yeah, I forget it. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't need it. Are you sure? Homegrown National Park is is uh, it's our it's our um, it's a nonprofit, a small nonprofit. Um, I got the idea of Homegrown National Park uh, a number of years ago when I said, "Well, gee, if we cut the area of lawn in half, that gives us twenty million acres we can put towards conservation right at home." And I started adding up the area of all our major national parks and you add them all up and it's still less than 20 million acres. So I said, well, gee, we can have the biggest park in the country. And if we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. Now that was all about just cutting the area of lawn in half, but there's a lot of other things that, that we can do that will add acreage to Homegrown National Park. <clears throat> a lot of things we can do in agriculture. We can restore the, the plants along roadsides. We can put in pollinator strips. We can restore the, the hedgerows. We can stop using neonic uh, insecticides, which uh, don't increase yield, but do kill an awful lot of insects. <clears throat> if you have a, a woodlot, in your yard, it's not long, and you're protecting it. That's part of Homegrown National Park, uh, and there's millions of acres of woodlots out there, particularly in in New England. Um, so the object was to get the message that everybody has an important role in conservation to the non choir, to all the people who don't realize that they don't see that they have any role in in conservation. The reason I say they do have a role is because everybody requires healthy ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? So we created Homegrown National Park and the map, it's simply a map of the US. You register your property for free uh, and, and put the area of your property that you're going to be a good steward of. So if you're reducing the area of lawn, you put that in there. If you plant a tree, what area does that cover? If you put one aster in a flower pot, that still qualifies a monarch will fly by and use that or your native bees will use that. You can be a member of Homegrown National Park and then your little piece of your county is going to light up. Uh, and we're working with a tech company now that's gonna expand that beyond the county so that the entire country lights up uh, and we get a visual of all the successful conservation efforts in the entire company, country. That's people who belong to, to National Wildlife Federation, all the Audubon members, wild ones, Sierra Club, everybody's going to join Homegrown National Park and we can see how successful our conservation efforts really are. Why is that important? Well, we've got this 3030 initiative. Um, everybody says it's Biden's 3030 initiative, but it's actually the UN's. We're gonna save 30% of the, of the world by 2030. There is no way we're going to do that unless we record successful conservation on private properties. And that's exactly what the map is, is going to do. Uh, and because we don't charge for homegrown national park, it doesn't pull members away from anything else. You can still be a member of Audubon. You can still be a member of National Wildlife Federation. Uh, we're just uniting everybody's conservation efforts into a single visual on that, that map. Uh, and when we do this, uh, it, it's going to encourage more people to join because um, it's success. We get to see success. We need a lot more success out there. So that's homegrown national park. Awesome. And I did just link your website, thehomegrownnationalpark.org. Org. Oh, yep. right. Yep. Yep. So that's already in the chat. So if anyone wants to take a peek, it's absolutely fascinating. You will get hooked. There is tons of information out there and ways to network. And there's also ways that answer some of the questions that a lot of us have pertaining to how can you recommend effectively talking to your friends and family and neighbors? So those of us who might not be under that umbrella of a homeowners association and just have those next door neighbors who are direct abutters and we have our pollinator gardens and we have our signs and then you have the <sighs> mosquito joes that comes by every two weeks yeah and and what they do on that property impacts you as well you know i'm, I'm talking about um you know the expression what happens in vegas stays in vegas well, what happens on your property doesn't stay in your property. So your plant choices impact everything around you. The size of your lawn impacts the watershed around you. 
Um, and all the products you put in, in your yard impacts everybody around you. Mosquito Joe impacts all your neighbors. So we have to start thinking. I know we've got personal private, you know, property rights, but what you do does impact everything else. And uh, it's a new mindset that we need to start thinking about. How do we convince the neighbors? You know, that's why I write the books. It's why I give these talks. It's, I don't know. It's a big challenge. I, I want to have a bring your neighbor night. You know, if this is recorded, yes. show it to, you know, have a little community action there, get a bunch of neighbors who would never, ever look at it. Just expend your neighborhood capital and, and say, do this for me. You know, I co-founded Homegrown National Park with Michelle Alfandari, and that's exactly how she got interested in this. She retired from a, a uh, branding uh, uh, business in Manhattan. She knew nothing about nature, just wasn't into it at all. And her neighbor dragged her to one of my talks. And then she became co-founder of Homegrown National Park. So that's what we need to do for everybody who just isn't thinking along those lines. That's an awesome idea. It's kind of having bringing back that neighborhood potluck and then offer, yeah. offering opportunities for conversation. Right. Awesome. Here is one from um, Jane, who has a question regarding oak leaves and storing them to assist the caterpillars and other creatures who overwinter in the leaves. Um, her concern is that she can't store all of the leaves directly under the oak as the trees are too close to the house. And the question is, is a pile 10 feet from the tree a suitable compromise? And I think that's a question a lot of us have is we want to leave the leaves, but can we move them to a safer location without impacting in a negative way our, our caterpillar Brethren. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of things here. My son bought a house a couple of years ago and the first fall he called me up and he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with them? I said, put them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. <laughs> That's a great way to shrink your lawn is to build bigger flower beds, expand those beds around your trees. If, if your tree's too close to the house, plant another tree and put a big bed around it. Um, the goal is to keep all the leaves that fall on your property on your property. Just like all the water that falls on your property, we want it to stay there. We want the leaves to stay there too. Now, the only place you can't have leaves is on the lawn that you're going to keep. Um, so we're going to have less lawn, but the lawn you keep is going to be manicured. You're going to be a good citizen. Uh, all your neighbors are going to love you. So you have to rake the leaves off, off those portions there. And if it's too many to put in your flower beds, then yes, create a, a compost heap someplace. And, excuse me, pile them up there. And then, you know, over the years, that becomes a, a great uh, mulch for your mulch. beds. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, we have another person, um, Michelle, who's saying that they have lost a dozen ash trees to emerald ash borer, elm to Dutch elm disease, and black cherry to fall webworm. Do the immature trees that are coming up to replace them still accommodate the insects attracted to them? Um, I am really surprised you've lost black cherry to fall webworm. I know they eat a lot, but uh, they rarely kill a tree like that. <clears throat> you know, I was focused on that. What was the actual question? You've lost a lot of trees. and will, will the ones that are kind of replacing them, so maybe the babies, the immature species of the same, of the same species, will they attract the same insects? Um, all right. Let's deal with each one of those. Emerald ash borer is, you know, terrible invasive species that is killing our elms. We're actually having pretty good uh, success with biocontrol of that. Bringing in, there's uh, two or three uh, egg parasitoids from China and larval parasitoid that are starting to have an effect. There was a county in New Jersey that had 80% control last year. So we've lost a ton of elms, but yes, those baby elms that are growing up, we're certainly hoping that by the time they get big enough for the ash borer to attack again, that we will have a handle on, on uh, the emerald ash borer. So yeah, please leave those baby ashes. Also, we're looking for resistance to these things. And the only way you're going to get resistance is to leave the babies and see which ones don't die. There's one or 2% of the ashes that have good resistance against uh, emerald ash borer. Those are going to be the future of our forests. That's true for, uh, that's true for all the pests that we have out there and, and especially for the diseases. You've got three or four serious diseases of oaks. It's killing the oaks. We've got um, nematodes killing our beaches. Uh, so there's a small portion of each population that has resistance to these things. So when the when the uh, arborist or forester comes by and said, don't plant oaks anymore because they're going to get sick, do just the opposite. 
plant twice as many oaks as you were going to and see which ones make it because those are the future of our, our forests. Having no oaks, having no ashes and no beaches, that's not an option. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Thank you. Um, we have someone uh, requesting suggestions for oaks for smaller properties. And I think that's an excellent one because a lot of us are like, whoa, uh, I don't know if I have the space for an oak. Is there Are there selective species that we should be looking for or is there just a resource that we could be directed to? Uh, well, in the east, there are some small oaks, not all that many, but one quickest mm -hmm. priorities, uh, dwarf chestnut oak is uh, in the trade. It's a good option. <clears throat> um, the... Uh, the oaks on our, our pine barrens, so things like a blackjack oak, don't get very big. But then there's another option that I, I'd love to see people try, and that is you can plant a regular oak, a red oak, for example, let it get to maybe two or three inches in diameter, then cut it off at the base, and it'll come back as a bush. That's that's coppicing. Yes. We used to do that all the time. We don't do it anymore. Yes. But you can have an oak bush, and you can have it for 100 years if you just keep cutting off the leader. So that's how you get these these uh, valuable leaves into your landscape. That is brilliant. I see you see that all the time. Anyone that lives near water, uh, particularly water that's inhabited by beavers, have I'm sure you guys have seen tons of coppiced trees, and they grow beech bushes, elm bushes, yeah. witch hazel bushes, anything you can imagine, and they are flush with leaves. Yeah. They're excellent yeah, tripping hazards too. <laughs> I forgot beavers are doing this for us. That's good. Yeah, right? So, uh, and then I'm trying to write these answers in as I'm going coppice, the regular red and whites. Awesome. Okay. Um, someone else is asking, um, uh, we mow late and in rotation. So we're on, a, on a, a lawn care question. We mow late and in rotation for birds and pollinators. Are there grassland mowing strategies that benefit caterpillars? Are there caterpillars on grasses? Is that a host yeah. for caterpillars? Okay. Oh yes, many, many, yeah. All of our skip, almost all of our skippers are on grasses, um, a number of our Lycenids. Uh, you know, we usually pick the, the mowing schedule to benefit the grassland birds, things like bobolinks, particularly in, in New Hampshire. And I would stick with that. Uh, you don't, you don't want to mow early and mess up the bird reproduction. <clears throat> um, that's a good question. I've never gotten that question before, okay. but you know, if you, uh, the, the real answer here is mowing simulates burning and burning a, a true meadow fire or prairie fire in the old days was patchy. It would burn here and there and go, but it wouldn't burn everything. And the patches that weren't burned or the patches that aren't mowed is what recolonizes the patches that are. So if you, if you have uh, if you have a, a grassland, if you have a meadow, the recommendation is to mow a third, a third, a third. So every, you're only mowing every, any one place once every three years, which means it goes two years without mowing. And that is the source where your, your caterpillars and your birds and everybody else can breed successfully. And then you're going to, you're going to mow, you know, just one third and that will recolonize the one third. You might have to control woodies that come in by spot treatment. Uh, when you wait for three years. But when, if you do that regularly, it's not a big deal. You can do a lot of area in, in you know, just a few short hours. Awesome, fantastic, thank you. Um, that was a great question, John Crockett. I wanna give you credit. Um, so Stephanie's asking, um, she, she preempts, I asked the chair of Concord's tree committee if they focus on planting native trees. His response was that they don't because they need to plant trees that will put up with things like salt and pollution of the city and that natives do not. How can one respond to that? It's funny that only plants from China can deal with salt and heat. <laughs> That's an urban legend. Yes, yes there are, are native trees that are sensitive to that, but there are native trees that are, that are good at that as well. Um, so the notion that only non-native trees are good at, at handling city conditions is it's just an urban legend. It's just not true. We have to find the ones. You can drive down through any city and find good native trees all over the place that deal with salt and deal with, with pollution. <clears throat> um, so I don't, I don't buy that for a second. Um, trying to think of a better response. You know, uh, red maple. 
is considered a tree of the swamp. You see that growing in low areas. But when I drive through the mountains of Pennsylvania, you get these, these rock cuts where they blasted the road right through a, a mountain. Growing on the sides of those rock cuts are red maples coming right out of the rocks. Now that's a genotype that would do really well on a street corner in a city because it's got um, access to just a little bit of moisture very little nutrients. It's a very stressful situation, but it's adapted to that. So we need to find the genotypes of our native plants that are good at these situations. Uh, black cherry, for example, is very good at salt. You go down and look along the coast. What is growing right in the, the salt spray? That's going to be good at, at salt. So we just haven't looked very hard for, for native plants. I heard a, uh, I guess it was an urban forester the other day say, Urban forests are not for wildlife, they're for people. That's a terribly terrible loss opportunity there. They're for both. And to have a forest that's dead because it's got nothing living in it, that's not gonna help people either. Um, you want a living forest. You want a forest where people can interact with not just the plants that are there, but the animals that are there as well. So giving up on wildlife in urban areas is a big mistake, it's not necessary. Fantastic. Um, I am. I, I just linked um, another homegrown national park link, uh, for lack of a better word, that is that presents a lot of the books that Professor Doug has been working on over the past few years. Because a lot of folks are coming in with questions of, what can I plant underneath my trees? What can go in this zone? What can grow here? Check out the books, guys. They're absolutely phenomenal. And find books that are discussing the native plants of your particular region. The more you educate yourself on those native, native plants, the more you can start thinking like nature and replicating it in your own backyards. Fortunately for us here in New Hampshire and Maine, and I believe Vermont, we have quite an amount of providers of native species now. It's a trend that is something we can all get behind and support. And the more we ask for our larger landscape places to support natives, the more natives they're going to provide in the coming years. So the less of these ornamentals from Asiatic countries that we are requesting, it's a supply and demand scenario. So ask for those natives, request those, request those natives and read the books first. Yeah. We have a nice easy question for you, Doug, after that. And it was, Emily's curious, as am I, um, what was the incredible zigzag patterned moth that was your second to last slide? It's really lacy. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe it wasn't an easy one. <laughs> no, it is an easy one. I'm just having a brain freeze. I get it in my backyard. The it book's right eight downstairs. Eight I could go grab it. Um, <laughs> it's a geometrid. Look up geometrids. Um, okay. You have if you have uh, moths of eastern uh, U.S. It's near the the end of the geometric section. I'm he sorry. No, it's okay. If I was he 20 was. years old. I could remember all this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's also eight o'clock on a Thursday. It's not that common. I get it once or twice a year, but. Right on. Awesome. Well, I think unless anyone has any additional questions, I do want to share a comment um, from Justin Richardson who writes, and those of you guys that are waiting, if you want to throw in one or two more questions, we've got time for just about that. Um, but the comment is for you, Mr. Jalmi, and it is, I own a third of an acre in a fairly dense suburban area of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Over the last four years, I have replaced lawns and added about 70 native species. I also got the city council to discontinue spraying for mosquitoes in 2020. This year, I had two Bombus ervidus, the golden northern bumblebee, visiting my property a species not documented by Fish and Game in New Hampshire since 1998. There are only five sightings in New Hampshire on iNaturalist. What this shows is that it is possible, even on a small suburban property, to make a difference. And we just need to do it before it is too late. And I think that is a really awesome, optimistic thing to wrap things up with tonight. I would love to give you the Homegrown National Park Award. We don't have such an award, but you should win it if we did, because that is exactly what we want you to do. That's a wonderful story. Well done, Justin, and well done all of you. Everyone in attendance here tonight, your <laughs> presence is making a difference. Take what you've learned, take the recording that will be coming your way in a couple short days and share it with the world. 
We are one small amount of people, but together we can make the difference that really does affect and impact our global population. Well put. Hey, thanks. <laughs> um, let's see, this has been terrific. So I think we are all set unless there's anyone that has any lingering questions. Otherwise, we just want to say thank you again for an inspiring, exciting, informative presentation. I know I had a ball and again, my brain is just like, because there's so much to take with. There's plenty of resources available out there. You guys now have that link directly to Doug's. I just remember oh. the moth. It's the yes, cherry scallop moth. The cherry scallop moth. There we go. It's there. See, it was just rattling around in that brain. <laughs> yeah, it, when you went like this, it, it popped out. <laughs> you got to use some hand gestures when we're on Zoom. It gets, gets a little stiff otherwise, right? Well, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Doug Tallamy. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Diane, thank you for being there co-hosting. We can't see you, but we appreciate you. And, and thank you for getting this all set up. We would not have been able to do this without you. So well, many, you. many thanks. Many thanks to Willa. And thank you so much, Doug, for sharing tonight. You are welcome. Everybody get out there and ask those libraries to make sure you have all of Doug's books. Purchase them yourself. They're fantastic. I'm, I'm speaking as someone that owns them all. They're really, really impressive. And they have taught me so much, not to mention when I have those neighbors that come by, I just conveniently locate them on my bookshelves, on my coffee table, sometimes have an extra copy. A little input goes a long way. So set the spark and get those fireflies back. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Take care, Thank everybody. Thank you, guys. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much for being here.